All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back after the two-parter with uh, Senator Orrin Hatch, and we're joined on the Malsberg panel by columnist and contributing editor for TheRoot.com, David Swerdlick, and columnist at Breitbart.com and American thinker C. Edmund Wright. Gentlemen, I welcome both of you. I, I, I'm interested in what your take is, David, on this. Um, um, Mary Landro, she uh, all of a sudden thinks that um, the Keystone Pipeline should be passed, and so do all the Democrats now. So Harry Reid, after all these years, is going to bring it to the floor of the Senate for a vote, and uh, they're going to call it the Landrow Keystone Bill or whatever. Uh, and the House is going to, which has already passed it, is going to uh, repass it and call it the um, Bill Cassidy Bill because that's who he's, she, she's running against in Louisiana in the Senate runoff. Um, politics at its uh, best or worst? Well, I don't know if I'm going to characterize it as best or worst. Look, clearly there's been this change of heart because Landrew is in the runoff with Cassidy. I don't think there's any way to sugarcoat that. Um, Democrats, I think, would be wise to try to figure out a way to uh, at least use this as somewhat of a bargaining chip with Republicans, just in terms of the sort of real politique of the situation. Um, but, but I don't think that there's going to be too much backlash to them moving ahead ultimately with the Keystone Pipeline. It is going to disappoint environmentalists, but um, you know this is, this is something that on balance is probably one of those things that the president and that Democrats can afford to compromise on uh, now that uh, Republicans uh, control both houses of Congress. So that's clearly where we're headed. So, uh, Edmund, do you think, uh, first of all, comment on the whole situation, but do you think the president will actually sign it? Because I really don't. Yeah. Well, and I think, I think that's one of the, David left that out, which was about the only thing I disagree with him on, although I have to say, this is politics at its worst. This is one of the most cynical, blatant. This finally, the Democrats are being transparent with with this with this you know absurd idea that they can try and save Mary Landrew with this. I will say this, Steve. We will find out uh, if the voters of Louisiana actually uh, are are trying to vote their conscience or if they're just absolute shameless takers of whatever crony capitalism Mary Landrew's able to convince them she can bring back to their state. Because if they fall for this, they are willfully uh, misled. Yeah, I don't know if it's going to make any difference for her at, at all. Um, let me ask you, um, uh, David, uh, what do you think of this, uh, this uh, the tape after tape? I think now there's three separate tapes of Jonathan Gruber, the MIT uh, uh, professor of economics who was an architect of uh, the Obamacare plan, you know, not only calling the electorate stupid, but basically, you know, saying that we couldn't be transparent, we couldn't tell the truth, because if we did, we wouldn't have gotten the bill. And it's more important that we have, that we have the bill than, than that we told the truth. And of course, the president lied over and over and over about if you like your doctor and your plan, you could keep it. Um, does this just make it even worse than it's been when you're talking about Obamacare? Well, Steve, here's my take on this. This may be the day that where there might be a little more common ground between me and Edmund and you than normally. Um, look, it doesn't look good what Gruber said. I don't think he, uh, if, if the, the, the tapes I've seen are right, I don't think he actually went as far as calling voters stupid, but clearly there was a lack of transparency about the way they were going about it. I don't know why he felt the need to make those comments publicly, even if he was in a room full of like-minded academics. It's just poor judgment on his part. This is the guy who advised Obama on Obamacare, advised Romney on Romney Care. Uh, he's, he's obviously not a politician. This is just the latest, you know, bad messaging episode for the administration on Obamacare. So there's no sugarcoating that. I got, got, I, all right, yeah, well, you're going to have a chance to respond, Edmund, when we come back. Ed, when we come back, we'll pick it up with Edmund on the responding on that. And, uh, folks, if you have ever been pulled over after having uh, a bit too much to drink, you have probably been asked to take a breathalyzer test. But do you have to? Is it in your best interest to take the test or not to take the test? Well, I don't have an answer to that, but let's find out with this installment of You and the Law with our friend Alan Dershowitz. It's next. Each year, more than a million Americans are arrested for drunk driving. I hope you were not one of them. Uh, it's a serious problem. And police regularly ask drivers to take a breathalyzer test. If you've been drinking, should you cooperate with the police and take the breathalyzer? It's not an easy question, and there's no easy answer. 
Some states will argue that you gave implied consent to the test when you received your driver's license and that you can't really say no. If that's the case, you have to obey the law. If you don't cooperate, the police may get a court order to take a blood sample. But in most states, you have the legal option not to take the breathalyzer and to refuse to cooperate. Still, there are other factors that may weigh on your decision. This includes um, how many drinks you've had, uh, when you had your last drink, uh, what you ate. All of these things may have an impact on how the alcohol will affect you. For example, according to some scientific studies, females need less alcohol to become drunk than their male counterparts, but the law has the same number for both men and women as to how to measure drunkenness. And in some states, the blood level alcohol is set at a very low threshold. Even two drinks taken quickly, close to the time of the test, could make you DWI. And what constitutes drunk driving varies by state. In some jurisdictions, age is a factor. The younger you are, the lower the blood alcohol level required for DWI. My advice is that if you're pretty sure you're under the limit, take the breathalyzer. But here's the flip side. If you're absolutely positive that you're over the limit, don't take the test. If you have the legal option not to, never break the law, obviously. Refusing to take the breathalyzer test may result in serious legal consequences, but those consequences are generally lower than if you were actually found to be DWI. Also, if you refuse the breathalyzer, you can still be convicted of drunk driving based on the policeman's testimony. The police are there to protect you, but you still have rights. Always remain respectful, never mouth off to a policeman, and get familiar with your state rules as to how many drinks you can consume before you're considered to be DWI. Also find out if you have the option in your state not to take the breathalyzer. Follow the law. Exercise good judgment. That's not always easy if you've had something to drink. And act accordingly. I'm Alan Dershowitz for Newsmax TV.